Let me start by acknowledging that the idea that I'm about to talk about is uh, jointly authored with my esteemed colleague, Billy Jack, in the economics department. I think the idea that I'm going to talk to you about is a very simple but potentially powerful solution to a pernicious and growing global health tragedy. Sorry. So most of you are probably familiar with backseat driving. The backseat driver is a passenger who doubts the competence of their driver and attempts to address those deficiencies while the driver is at the wheel. We've all been victims Many of us have been victims or culprits of this practice at one time or the other. For many of you who are still quite young, it's probably the memory of learning how to drive and dealing with the advice and commentary of family and friends. For others, it's the spouse who can't stop giving you know, lane change and speed advice on the highway. In my particular case, I sometimes have to commit to shutting my eyes while my wife drives. <laughs> and as you will see, a lot of that may be informed by, by the research. Now, memories of backseat driving probably conjure up feelings of stress, fear, panic, a lot of the things that Liz was talking about earlier. And I don't think many of you think that backseat driving was helpful in making you the competent drivers you are today. But what backseat driving shares with the idea that I'm about to talk about is that the advice from these passengers triggers powerful responses. The brain registers this communication, whether it's unhelpful, whether it's clear, whether, as in this cartoon, it is helpful but unclear. The driver's name is Cliff, by the way. Took me a while to. <laughs> it's very difficult to ignore this, ad this advice. And this is probably why we think that backseat driving exerts a pretty large and potentially undesirable tax on the attention that we need to be paying to the road. But before I talk about the idea, let me take a small detour into the grim world of global health statistics. So the World Health Organization estimates that about 55 million people die each year. And the world, and they've spent a lot of time and effort to draw up a ranking of the top 20 killers in the world. And a lot of these are well known, right? So the most recent Global Burden of Disease study of 2010, you know, identifies malaria. We know a lot about that. It's the 11th most, most uh, leading killer of, of people. Tuberculosis, HIV and AIDS, ranked 10th and 6th respectively. But what I suspect most of you do not know, that road traffic incidents are the eighth leading cause of death in the world. And at current trends, because we have a global fund for malaria, HIV, and tuberculosis, malaria and tuberculosis are going to fall off the list of leading causes of death, and it's fall out of the top 20. So malaria and tuberculosis will do that. HIV will drop down to 10th road traffic accidents will climb to the fifth leading cause of death. Okay? And in fact, the estimation is that road traffic accidents will kill more people than are killed by these three diseases in 20 years. So fact number two is that road traffic accidents kill young people. The leading cause of death for people aged 15 to 29 are road traffic incidents. But here's just a little footnote. In the places where road traffic accidents are a big problem, even the most powerful people are not immune. In Kenya, where we've been working, a former president and a sitting president have both been victims of road traffic incidents. Now, the bulk of this burden of road traffic incidents is felt in very poor countries. Poor and middle-income countries only have about half the cars in the world, but account for 92% of all fatalities and injuries, 92%. One other way to sort of think about that is poor countries have only about one-tenth the number of cars per person as, as, as in rich countries, but nine times 
the fatalities and injuries experienced. So when you listen on the radio every morning about you know, 495 being jammed up because of accidents, yeah, a lot of these accidents cause a lot of stress and an inconvenience. They rarely kill. About 1.3 million people die each year from road traffic incidents. An estimated 20 to 50 million people are injured and suffer very costly disabling injuries. We're in the third year of the Decade for Action for Road Safety. The World Health Organization has tried to bring attention to this, to this global health tragedy. But as you can see from this quote, they're pretty desperate. Road traffic injuries are predictable and largely preventable, but there's not much attention being paid to this scourge. What can we do? Well, a starting point for thinking about how to address this problem is to think about the experience of poor and rich country road users. As with a lot of global health disparities, development matters. We've heard a lot about development today. Development means wider, smoother, safer roads. It means safer vehicles. It means better and more rapid management of crash victims. It also means better regulation, which includes certification of drivers and vehicles. But while we all wish for development to happen as rapidly as possible, few, if any of us, know how to bring it in a short space of time. Where, where development has arrived in recent times, it's taken decades. And in historical perspective, that's a blistering pace. And in the short run, foreign aid is not going to get us there either. To quote a popular tagline, safe cars cost, will cost millions of dollars, good roads will cost billions of dollars, good regulation may be priceless. So like with all other problems, it is daunting. But is it enough to stop there and say, well, let's wait until these countries get there? Well, safe roads depend also on the behavior of road users. And that behavior change can happen now. And the question is, how can we make that behavior change happen? That is the focus of the idea I'd like to talk about. The context that we're working in is a little different. So let me sort of explain what, how people get their transport services in a lot of poor countries. This is a 29-seater in, in Kenya, uh, and that's a 14-seater. And for the economic nerds in the audience, you may recognize a very famous economist on, on the 14-seater. Okay. These types of vehicles account for a large share of transport services in developing countries. And sadly, they also account for a large share of injuries and fatalities. So the idea that my colleague Billy Jack and I have been testing is pretty simple. Inside these vehicles, we insert stickers with messages aimed at the passengers, motivating them to speak up directly to their driver if, he, if they feel that he is driving recklessly. There is no number to call, no police report to be filled, just simply a heckle or a chide. But in order to actually test this idea, we need two things to happen. So first, we have to convince passengers that they should speak, say, speak up. And these passengers, for the most part, live with a lot of stress and, and face a lot of risks. So that's the first stage. And to address that problem, we went to people in the persuasion business. And we asked a marketing agency who gave us their time and uh, one or two people to come up with a series of messages, which we took to minibus users in Kenya and asked you know, which of these messages will actually get you to speak up if you're in, uh, facing, uh, if you're in a reckless vehicle. And we had some predictions about which of these stickers would work, and I, I don't have time to show you all of them, but we were, my colleague and I, were terribly wrong. 
these are the messages that came out top. So is one in English, which is self-explanatory. The other two were in Swahili. And there's a little uh, translation. These stickers, about 60% of the passengers we asked said this would work. And then the other two stickers is one. 80% of the passengers we interviewed said, if I had that sticker in front of me, I would speak up. And there's the last sticker that we uh, used, very similar. So very striking message. So the next st stage was to say, well, let's see if we can actually get these stickers into some vehicles and test this idea. And we needed a large number of vehicles, 2,500 in fact. Uh, and if, if it wasn't for the tenacious efforts of my co-author, I guess we may have, I wouldn't be standing here. Uh, he certainly wouldn't take no for an answer and went day after day and talked to a wide range of different people and we ended up with 2,500 vehicles that we could actually test. But if you look closely at this sticker, it says the driver is the villain. So how do you get a driver to accept you can actually place these stickers inside his vehicle. And we tried something the very first time and it, you know, without actually thinking hard about what was going on, and it failed. So that was our little pilot study. Uh, and then we came up with the idea of a lottery. A little incentive for the drivers to actually accept these stickers. And lottery was run every week, and if you were, your vehicle was drawn and had all five stickers, you could win up to about a week's wages. And that worked. So we put these five stickers in about 1,300 vehicles and followed another 1,200 vehicles over a period of 15 months. We also had the good fortune of getting access to all accident records from the four insurance companies that cover vehicles in Kenya. So by now, you probably guess that you know, we must have found some positive results. Why would, I, why would I be standing here if we didn't find any positive results? In fact, the results we find are staggering. Vehicles that were offered these stickers had accident rates that were fully 50% lower than vehicles that did not get the stickers. 50%. If you restrict this analysis to just, vehicle, to just accidents that involved injuries and claims, this actually increases to about 60%. It's a very, very large effect. In fact, I've been shaking my computer uh, for the last sort of few years just to make sure there's not something going on with, uh, with that. Okay. But one little nagging result that we wanted to resolve was, you know, how much of this was due to the stickers and the, the heckling that we hoped that we were generating in the vehicles, and how much was this due to the lottery, the little bribe? So we run another large experiment, and this time we had the benefit of 12,000 customers of an insurance company. So a large, you know, large sample means we could do lots of things. So we can test to see if the lottery actually works, so we can put stickers that wish uh, road users a safe journey, but don't actually ask them to do anything, and see if the lottery uh, will actually sort of reduce accidents. But we can also ask other things about the design, the, the optimal design of an intervention like this. So we can ask things like, is fear an, is an important ingredient in sort of motivating people to speak up? Or does collective action do a better job than messages that direct uh, that are motivating uh, passengers to speak up on their own. And we can also ask whether we need to tell people that they have the right and capacity to speak up. My colleague just presented the preliminary results of this larger study yesterday. And we still find very large reductions in accidents. Reassuringly, the lottery does not seem to be the reason we find these reductions in accidents. So how much does this cost, you ask? As you can imagine, these are a bunch of stickers, next to nothing. 
A good investment in global health saves one disability adjusted life year for $100 or less. Our very conservative calculation suggests that this intervention could save that one life at the cost of just under $6. That's about as cost effective as childhood vaccinations. But the trouble with childhood vaccinations and other amazing health technologies is getting them to the people who need them. And I think for this particular context, we have both very motivated actors and arguably more effective, at least as for now, who stand to gain a lot from producing, distributing, and ensuring the compliance of this intervention. Private insurance companies can make a lot of money using an intervention like this. Bus companies can do the same. This idea, while quite simple, saves lives, livelihoods, property, and makes some people rich. And it doesn't require any electricity, internet connection. It requires tenacity. If I learned anything from these experiments, and I, which I mostly learned from my co-author, it is the tenacity to keep knocking on doors, to keep telling people who did not believe, and a lot of people have not believed these results. The insurance company we're working with is an example of a company that eventually sort of realized after, in, in some sense, gave in, I'd say, to the uh, constant uh, requests that we made, and has reaped the benefits of a very, very cheap intervention. I'd like to ask all of you to make heckle and chide a part, a desperately needed part of the decade for action for road safety.